Wellness by Designs, and I'm your host, Andrew Whitfield Cook. Today, we're welcoming back Brett O'Brien from Core Naturopathics, and we're discussing today therapy intensity for various conditions. Welcome to Wellness by Designs again. Brett, how are you going? Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? Thanks for having me back. It's great. An absolute pleasure. Now, in our last podcast, we covered your actual clinic and the clinic setup, which I've got to say blew my mind. It was like walking into a private hospital. It was absolutely fantastic. So for everybody listening for the first time, go and check out that podcast. But let's today delve into therapy intensity. Now, you've got all of the bells and whistles. You don't always need to employ everything. Some things are simple, some things are more involved. Let's delve into that a little bit. So if we can start off with things that are of a simple nature, that many naturopaths and herbalists and nutritionists see day to day, things like, um, you know, recurrent immune infections, forgive me, recurrent infections, for instance, um, or, you know, immune depletion. Can we go through what you'd employ there and maybe where you'd increase the intensity of therapy? Okay. Um, I think it's first really important to, to understand about going back to naturopathic philosophy and, and really trusting that implicitly that it actually works. And that's very much around what the clinic does is that we know implicitly that homeostasis and the body's capacity to self-regulate is an absolute. So really what we want to do is we want to identify roadblocks, why someone can't self-regulate. And instead of a diagnosis, we actually look at, well, let's see if we can use some tools to identify roadblocks, remove the roadblocks that we can see, and then the body will self-regulate independently. And that's really how we understand, say, the immune system. We know a lot more about the immune system now and we can say, well, really, instead of looking at the immune system, maybe we need to look at the gut. Maybe that capacity to um, achieve that plasticity in the immune system really is determinant on gut function. So let's, if we can identify that, you know, there's some issues around gut function, let's clean that up because we know, you know, 70% of our immune regulation is going to come from digestive function, the microbiome. So we clean that up and then we remeasure again. So then we make sure that we're always gaining that traction and momentum as far as the immune function is concerned. So we're not necessarily looking at the diagnosis or the symptom, but we're looking at the drivers. And that's the most important process that we need to do is just identifying roadblocks, remove any roadblocks. You might, whatever tools you have, simple as they might be, identify the roadblock, remeasure and make sure that roadblock is then, um, I guess, depleted and the body is in that position to self-regulate. So that's how we look at it. Of, of course, when we're talking about roadblocks, that's the detective work of any health practitioner. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're not always obvious. You, you no. For instance, if you see recurrent ear infections in a child, there's, you know, the, the usual suspects. You know, we look at dairy, we look at wheat, um, and we see what effect the avoidance of those foods can have possibly with some food, some um, natural therapies, but certainly at least at some stage on their own and just see, can we re-challenge? Can, how does that person handle maybe a little bit of these foods in their diet? But when you're talking about retesting, um, it's something that I really like. You've obviously got to be a little bit judicious of this though, correct? Mm. Yes, very much so. Yeah, yeah. I think I think we've got to be I think we've got to be much more I guess skilled in our detective capacities. I think that's where naturopaths are really excelling because one thing we have more time with our clients generally to do more investigation, to do more of that detective work, and then it's just having the skills to to use um, different methodologies to work out how we can test it and how we can retest. And there are lots of different ways you can do that. Um, When setting this clinic up 15 years ago, you know, we had a limited amount of tools. We still use those tools today, though. They're still an important part of this clinic. So 
it's I guess for naturopaths in general, it's it's good to have low cost um, uh, tools that you've got within the clinic that you can uh, implement or use readily um, that the client can see because I think that's really important that the client is involved in that process and they can identify change over time um, and and really have a look at the multitude of, of testing that we can use and might not necessarily be mainstream techniques but certainly things like you know general tools in the clinic are really important as long as you can create, create a baseline and create, then your treatment creates the traction and momentum. It should create that change. Right. Okay. So let's go into a few conditions where I guess intensity would be an obvious variance. Um, so if we looked at common immune insults, coughs and colds, the, the general, uh, you know, uh, problems of winter if i say that mm. um mm. let's go into some simple stuff and when would you intensify that therapy can we start with just coughs and colds yeah i guess uh, first of all you use those tools that you have to have the capacity to look at what the immune system's doing um i guess that's the baseline so you're not necessarily looking for a diagnosis as an naturopath but you're looking to create a baseline what this person looks like at presentation. So then you can be able, then you have the capacity to measure over time whether the therapy is effective. So you could use simple tools. I use blood work. Um, we want to take a simple start. And then we look at, well, what kind of complexities are generally in this person? They might come in with a common cold, but when you start that investigation process, underneath the surface, you may see a whole heap of complexity to that. So then you're identifying multiple roadblocks. Other people can come in and, and there's nothing underneath the surface. There's nothing as part of that jigsaw puzzle that we really need to investigate more other than the fact that they, it's winter, it's cold season, you know, they might have kids at daycare. That's the classic one at the moment and they're going to get reinfected over time. So really what you're actually just introducing is a support process, allowing the, the immune right. system to self-regulate. Um, you know, simple herbals are always, you know, the, the first point of call. If you identify anything more complex, then you start to educate, I guess, the client about the complexity uh, of, of their systems and you generally advise them about taking a little bit more care or a little bit more um, of a dive deeper into their overall immune system. But generally, if it's that really surface stuff, it's pretty easy. Everyone knows those simple herbals, those go-tos, that acute you know, treatment, get them back in again, recheck them. You know, that's a really good way to develop a relationship with your clients is get them in, allow them to see the changes they can then point it out. They become then the masters of their own health. And that's really what we're trying to do is educate our clients to a point where they have a much better capacity to regulate their own health. And we become a resource or, or part of that management team that they use that process. It's, re it's really interesting what you said about daycare. Um, just before I move on to the question that I really want to ask about it, but do you find that you always take some sort of baseline? Like you were talking about blood work previously. Do you always do blood work mm. or do you just sort of, do you wait until there's a recurrence and you're going, hmm, there's possibly something going on here? Yeah, it's really interesting over the years and particularly when, you know, we're looking at this point in time whether when you've got things like telehealth, being you know utilized much more is my testing skills if i'm not using it it feels like i'm kind of driving at night without the headlights on you know i really find that my testing kit is really takes the guesswork out of it I, every single client that i see what what i do is is they tell me their story how they see it and understand it. What the testing does is allows me to see the relevance of their story 
and what else we can join up to that story that might be part of what they're investigating. So they may know part of the story, but we can see something much deeper, which is always really important, or we can see those things that they don't understand themselves. So these little bits and pieces are really important. So for me, after using baseline equipment for so long, it's my go-to. It, it makes me feel much more secure. Really nowadays, it's about how quick I can get results as well. And I'm results driven and really yep. guesswork takes a lot longer to navigate. If I've got simple tools and going back to understanding homeostasis, you know, identifying roadblocks, you don't necessarily identify the disease but you may start to just be able to remove some of those roadblocks so the body starts to self-regulate. Then you're measuring the capacity that the, that the, ha that the body has to self-regulate. So that's where they're so important. Cool. If I don't have those two, those baselines, I really can't get a good measurement of the effectiveness. And so to my, to my main uh, question, and that was, um, for instance, when you've got a, a, a mother, um, with kids at daycare, you mentioned, and you see the mother with recurrent colds, snotty noses, I mean, heaven forbid diarrhoea but <laughs> or gut issues, but, yeah, yeah. but you see the mother as the patient mm. and you're talking about roadblocks. Do you ever twig and go, hang on, you've got a kid in childcare, bring the child in and look at their nutritional status and you might find out, for instance, that they've got pica, they're eating soil and sand and, and things where that might give you a hint of a nutritional deficiency. There's the problem that you're getting recurrent colds. Yeah. The mother is the presenter. Do you find that? Do you, do you have to get really into that detective work about, hmm, you know, be a super sleuth? Yeah, and I guess that really is the fun part about what naturopaths do, I think. That's what I really love is that investigative work. Um, you know, naturopaths really are managers of people's conditions rather than the holder of the information now, you know. So the, the capacity to be that sleuth is really a skill that I think is in demand in the community, and that's where naturopaths can really serve a really specific role. You know, we have a specific set of skills, we have a specific amount of time to do this. Um, and it is, it really is about managing people's health. It's about coaching them through. It's not so much about holding the information. So, of course, you're talking to the kids, you're investigating what they're up to. You know, it's every parent's nightmare when their child goes to daycare for the first time because <laughs> And you just see it over and over again. So it's fairly standard that, yeah, if you get a parent coming in with recurrent colds, I've got, you know, someone coming in today and he's under this pressure at work, but he's had time off over the last month. He's got a three-year-old and a one-year-old and it's just classic. Um, and so, yeah, you're looking at, yeah, you're looking at the kids as well and him, he's run down, you know. It's a very, it's a very standard story, but when you start including the family, then you start this, uh, I guess, this social engagement. You're not only treating mm -hmm. an, or involved in individuals, but you're involved with whole families. And I guess that's the next stage as far as the work that we do is that we work within that community structure as well. So then it's, you know, you're educating people around. It's not just your health, it's your family's health, which is part mm -hmm. of that holistic process of, and the services that naturopaths can uh, provide really effectively. I love what you do. I love how you uh -huh. think not just about patient treatment, but you think community. And it, it's I, mm. I'm just so so enthused with what you guys do. Let's move on. So more Thanks. serious concerns. So when you when you're dealing mm. with chronic fatigue, for instance, multitude uh, of etiologies. Um, I guess the 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 big hurdle that every practitioner faces, it's such a frustrating condition. And the mm. biggest thing is trying to get them back to previous. Can you yeah. get people back to previous, particularly when, in my experience, 
the people that I've tried to help with chronic fatigue refuse to learn the meaning of pace. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. will yeah, not yeah, pace yeah. themselves. It's a big one, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a it's it's chronic fatigue. I, I kind of when I when I think about it, it's always it's it's almost like a state of uh, bankruptcy is the way I always look at mm. it. When I talk to clients, it's all about, you know, how much money you've got in an account and, and something like just because you've got $10 in your bank account doesn't mean you spend 15 you know, and that's, I guess, what you're talking about. It's always that problem as far as how do you build that reservoir first before you can launch someone. And I guess that's what we look at with chronic disease is you've really got to build that foundation first. Um, if you don't build the foundation work, if you try and launch anyone, then they're just burning up, you know, fuel without any real capacity to get results. And I think, you know, I, I, we, we tend to charge after the disease. Um, and I think when we built this clinic, you know, we were getting people ready to go overseas to large clinics in Germany or, um, you know, America or South America. And we we'd be getting people ready and there'd be this variation of results when they came back. And so we started to look at, well, why the variation? You know, they're having the same treatment. There's a similar condition. Why are people coming back with variations as far as results? And what we realised is individuals are going with their own set of resources. And what happens if they're resource poor and they go for these really complex treatments then they tend not to get as good a result. And again, it goes back to homeostasis. There are too many roadblocks for their body to be able to self-regulate, to be really to be able to benefit from that therapy. You need the body free to, uh, I guess that, and plasticity I think is really important, and adaptation. They need the capacity to adapt. But if they're poorly resourced, then you're gonna run into trouble. So I guess with something like chronic fatigue, we look at how well resourced they are. You know, we get complex diseases, but we get people in here that are really healthy. So that means that we can then push and, and create this push and recovery process much more effectively, and we can pace them with a, a lot more confidence. If we have someone that comes in who are re is really poorly resourced, nutritionally deficient, then really we shouldn't really go after the disease until we see that platform develop first. And again, that's where our baseline tests are effective, that we identify the deficiencies, we, we build them up, we, we re-measure, make sure that when they become well resourced, then we launch them and then you start to see the results. So I guess, you know, with something like chronic fatigue, you've got, I guess you've got the metabolic side and you've got the immune side, two different aspects. Really, you have to get those two well resourced, and they, you know, they could and classically they come in with everything else. They come in with nutritional deficiencies, poor gut function, you know, chronic sinusitis. You know, you're seeing all these other conditions. You start chasing the chronic fatigue, and really, they don't. They're not resourced well enough. So build those resources first. Identify what those deficiencies are. Build it get them robust, get them some money in their bank account first, and then you can launch. And then you start, to, you tend to get much, much more effective and beneficial results. I think, I think you said a very telling thing there about money in their bank account. There's a twofold thing. One is the analogy that you talk about with health, money in their bank account. The other thing, and I've seen this, is people going overseas spending scores of thousands of dollars. Mm where you could get more than that, better treatment than that in Australia for a fraction of the cost. It is insane to me how these people go overseas. I don't know why. Um, I, and forgive me, I have saw this in a heartbreaking issue with a, a woman with cancer, you know, who despite my protestations, she refused chemo. Um, and she went overseas where indeed the diagnosis that they gave her had a different connotation in Australia. They said remission over there, which in Australia the equivalent is stasis, not remission. Um, so, of course, she stopped all therapy and 
it was it was a drastic um horrible outcome but but the whole thing about bank account with regards to getting getting enough reserves for people to be able to um, embark on that slow incline, that crawl back to their previous health before the insult. What's your timeline? How hard do you have to go with things like far infrared saunas, with other, um, you know, testing and, and therapeutic machines that you guys have? How do you gauge? How do you strategize it? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, you, you again, you're building the resources first. So often they may have done a lot of work before they come, come in. You know, if you want to get traction and momentum, it might be using IV therapy, might be the capacity, and that may just be hydration. A lot of people come in and they just can't, they, they just don't identify simple things like hydration. Um, eating wow. regularly, you know, hypoglycemia is a really big a factor as far as, you know, that traction and momentum, that capacity to produce energy. So simple things can often be really beneficial for that workup. Then you get, it's kind of you, what tends to happen is you see it as a, as a practitioner, all of a sudden the lights come back on. And um, I was just talking with a client the other day and I said, I didn't even know that you were English because your voice was so slight and so low when you came in, I didn't even hear it. And then all of a sudden she's coming back and she's getting that vitality back. And then all of a sudden she's throwing her voice out, you know, really simple things like that. That's where that detective work comes in as well. Wow. You start to notice these slight changes. You start to notice this spark. You start to notice light bulb moments where they start to, cognitively understand their situation much more, um, I guess, effectively or efficiently. They sense that they have this energy to actually start to move forward. And so as a practitioner, you're looking for those moments. Then what we can do is we can start the process. And when we start using our equipment, we're actually measuring right through that process as well. And so we can see whether that person is actually responding effectively to the equipment. So we, we've kind of got a minimum standard with each piece of equipment. So if people aren't reaching that, then we kind of we, we understand that their body still doesn't have those resources to push forward. And these are, you know, uh, these take a lot of energy to actually get through. So through this process, people might be in here for three or four hours in a day. And that might be five to six days a week. So it's really important that they're, they're really well resourced to be able to get the results. But what we can see over time is we can see whether it's effective or not. If we're finding that we, we create that little push and they're so exhausted from that small push, then we know that they're not ready to go forward. So then we pull back and we start to look at more support, you know, more strategies as far as what resources that person's missing and why they're not in a position to get that traction and momentum and that adaptation effect, which is really what we're trying to, to have an effect on. Do you check, um, do you make assessments before patients are ready to move to the next stage? Do you sort of check in and say, not just nutritionally, but do you say do blood work, for instance, to say, listen, you're not ready for the far infrared sauna yet. You, you know, you're not ready for this type of. Do you do that? Yeah, yeah, we do, and we can even put them into our equipment, and we can see we're measuring what their their metabolics are doing all the time. So, if we're using a small amount of heat, say we're using forty six degree heat, and their internal body temperature is 36.1 degrees. And over that half an hour, there's just no change in the body. You know, there's no heart rate increase. The internal temperature doesn't increase. Then we really know that the body doesn't have those resources to really become robust and raise that internal temperature. You know, we want that sort of mild fever mechanism to actually come mm. into play. 
And what can happen is, you know, you might have those low temperature, you know, half an hour, they come out of it and they're exhausted. Well, we know that really they're not in a position to benefit from that. So it may be that they're using hyperbarics, you know, more nutritionals, you know, more diet, sunlight, you know, really simple things are often mm -hmm. the best practices before. So we're measuring right through and after doing this for so many years, you start to understand the, someone's capacity to respond. We might have someone with this, exactly, the, exactly the same diagnosis and they'll come in and we'll have them at 50 degrees inside, you know, this, this chamber and they'll actually then, you know, getting internal temperatures of 39 degrees and their pulse rate will be 140 beats per minute. And you can see this robustness of the body and they'll get out and they'll feel good and they'll feel like they've achieved something. And you're, you can tell the very specific differences between people and their capacity for adaptation. Because really what we're actually inducing is the body's capacity to adapt. That's really what homeostasis and the capacity to bring someone back into health is about. It's their capacity to change and adapt in a positive direction. And that's what we're always measuring and trying to achieve. Just, just a point, I guess, of safety with regards to thermotherapy. Um, you know, you're looking for an improvement um, of stress adaptation, uh, um, uh, an ability to raise blood pressure and pulse and things like that. But there's also the characteristics of that pulse. So, if, for instance, if it's a bounding pulse, you know, you might have an, uh, a concern about blood pressure or if it's a thready pulse or an, uh, uh, um, an uh, I've got the wrong word, an infrequent pulse, come on, um, ectopics. Atrial yeah, fib yeah. is AF. what I'm looking at. <laughs> yeah. yeah, AF, yeah, thank yeah. you. So it, it, the characteristics of the pulse and the blood pressure. So I guess this goes back to a big lesson that I learned early on in my nursing, and it was when I was feeling rather overwhelmed. And I'll always remember this nurse, Sister Geddes who I've got to say many people didn't like because she could be very blunt, but because I was like a child and kept on asking questions, why, 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 for some reason she liked me and I, I confided in her that I was feeling overwhelmed and she said, look, you can learn that stuff with experience and over time. Right now I want you to observe your patients and it's exactly what you just said. You, um, you were talking about twinkle in their eye, the character of their voice, the the physical um, reactions to a stressor, these sorts of things, mm. but but it's was the more nuanced things as well, the twinkle, the character of their voice, the confidence, the spark. I, I the, forgive me, but it you impress me, man, because because oh, it's you. these yeah. little things that we so often forget when we're caught up in oh, yeah. being a professional. Mm. Um. So the question, I guess, from here is when do you raise a red flag to go, whoa, that, like it's not just they're not ready, there's an issue here. What do you look for, Thready Pulse, for instance? Yeah, the, you can, you know, you, you see people can degrade quite quickly from these processes. So you might induce a small amount of heat but their response is completely outside of what would be expected. So, you know, absolute exhaustion. We, you know, we can, you know, look at oxygen saturation becomes really poor, pulse rate drops. You know, these are all indicative of someone's capacity to adapt. They don't have the resources. You know, their pallor changes. You, you know, they come out of heat and they're white, you know, and it really gives some fairly quick indications. Also, when you're talking to them, so you're never allowing them to go through these processes in isolation. So there's a constant dialogue that's happening. And through that dialogue, you're checking in, you know, you're making sure they're okay. Um, and and so it, it, it's the relationship, it's the nuances, it's knowing the person when they first come in. That's really something that I've strived to do is to keep a memory of the person when I first met them compared to when I see them again over time. And that reference point 
gives me an indication of, uh, really about what's happening with that person, regardless of what they're telling me, you know, and this is the yeah. fun part of it, you know, that investigative quality is that they make, you know, classically, yeah, I'm fine, you know, no, it couldn't be better. And you're just looking at someone that's what? just empty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, you're like, okay, then you, that face is great for everyone else. But when you walk in this door, it just doesn't cut it. You know, and that for a lot of people, they can relax and they can say, no, actually, life's pretty crummy at the moment. You know, because <sighs> stress response, another big part of what we do, you know, with chronic diseases, it's probably the stress response that, the hypothalamus's capacity around regulation is probably the ter- determining factor around chronic disease. So stress is a massive part. Um, we need an environment when people come in that they can somehow relax, feel comfortable, mm. feel comfortable with the environment and the people. So they're not on this constant, you know, roundabout. And it's 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 only got worse with dr google because there are just so many rabbit holes now for people to to jump down for into sure. that there's that constant stress response so we really got to get that stress response reduced as quickly as we can as a determinant factor as far as someone's capacity i think i always talk about it that basically as long as you're in fight and flight you're never in recovery um the right. body will sacrifice everything for the concept of survival a salient point, a salient lesson. But I've got to say, I admire the way that you guys, um, you know, have a very open, welcoming clinic. I mean, it's gorgeous. Um, which, forgive me, and it's not just the clinic, it's your demeanour and and the way that you guys talk about and with your patients that would break down barriers, that would enable them to feel comfortable with vulnerability so despite their physical complaint that they're seeing you about there's that emotional component that you can look after them with um just one last question for you brett and that is regards to these patients that don't do well or that cannot gain or regain homeostasis and there are those what happens with regards to referral for let's say you know pharmaceutical medication in some instances if somebody's really severely depressed or um, let's say somebody cannot regain a physical mobility that they that you'd hoped for and so it may require surgery and certainly there's Mm. those people that come in with regards to cancer and they may need a very stern talking to about you know looking at not just partnering with chemo but some people refuse chemo and sometimes it's you just can't work without without these medicines. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How do you navigate yeah. those conversations? I, I always start off with, I guess, that, you know, we, I, we've got all this kind of therapies that we can use, you know, and, and what naturopaths really fit into well is we're not the last resource. We're kind of like at the beginning. And when I first started talking about this clinic, I said, you know, I wrote at the top, we'll know when we're succeeding, when we see people at the beginning and not at the end, you know, and, and I and when we started this 10 years ago, you know, people had were choosing natural therapies because there were no other options, you know, and that yeah. was the worst yeah. case scenario for us. And so really we're the people that work at the beginning. We're the people that do the groundwork. We're the people that do that, you know, that really good foundational work. And so... I believe that, you know, all the other therapies are are in this timeline. It's when you actually activate those or or participate in in those different therapies as far as time-wise is concerned. Of course, it doesn't matter what therapy you use. If the foundation's good, then the capacity to adapt and recover at any kind of therapy then has a massive improvement. There are such better outcomes with people getting that foundational practice right. And that's really where we sit. So over half of our clients are using a a, a conventional protocol as far as their health is concerned. And we fit into that as far as playing a very specific role. So really we're not saying, well, it's either this or, or, or them. We're saying, well, what's our role in this process for you and how can we just help you 
and your capacity to get through this and recover. So really, it, it is always that foundational process. And naturopathy has a place within medicine. It has an awesome place within medicine. But it's not the only answer. It's the capacity then for people to use the other therapies. And because of the work that we've been involved with with that client, they only get much better results. So what we see, for instance, is people who should be presenting as quite sick are actually presenting as quite healthy. And so, you know, one oncologist said to a client, you know, when they'd gone through the therapies and they said, well, you know, we've gone through the mastectomy, you know, what now? And she said, well, really, I only see, you know, I really don't see healthy people. Um, I really see sick people. And so she had no place for a person that recovered well, got through the surgeries, got through the treatment and was generally healthy. And that's our ideal. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, it's such a wonderful thing you say because let's take pain, for instance. Um, I have podcasted with a, a man who I have the utmost respect for, Greg Mapp, a pharmacist, very much retired now. Um, but he used to pick up the pieces of the opioid-dependent uh, people and he used to consult very intensively to try and get people off opioids and try and get them off to uh, off onto more natural certainly there's toxic equivalents, whilst mm. still managing their pain, let's say it's pain. Um, whereas yeah. what you're talking about is seeing people at the beginning, helping them to regain mobility, lessen pain, so they don't have to use so heavy an opioid uh, regimen. And so they might have to use some, but it's, it's not such a dependent. And so their risk of opioid dependence is vastly reduced. And so their health the healthcare system is going to thank them um, for, for, you know, later on down the track. It's a monetary benefit for the healthcare system. It's brilliant what you're doing. Yeah. I'm so impressed. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. yeah, pain's a big one. So, it, um, oh. yeah. It's the hardest one. It really is. Yeah, it is the hardest one. So, look, there are so many rabbit holes we could go down <laughs> um, uh, today, Brett, but yeah. thank you so much for taking us through the intensity and, and sort of how you might strategize intensity with various patients and, indeed, your detective work and your care for patients being attuned to not just their symptoms but their nuances of how they're looking and how they're interacting with you. Well done. And I look forward to podcasting with you again at some, at some stage. Thanks so much uh, for joining Great. Us. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Andrew. Have a good day. And, of course, everyone, thank you for joining us today. Remember that all the other podcasts and the show notes for this podcast can be found on the Designs for Health website. So thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook and this is Wellness by Designs. Oh, 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 oh,